Hello everyone, welcome to NPTEL Rural Water Resource Management course. We are today on week five, lecture one. In the previous lectures, the past two weeks, we looked at groundwater hydrology, and this will be the last lecture series on groundwater, the more specifics about the parameters and how they are helping to understand the groundwater hydrology. Let's look at the recap of week four and then how it is linked to week five, which is the current week. In the week four, we introduced the groundwater hydrology components uh, and then we looked at which bodies are monitoring and measuring the groundwater. What are the issues and concerns? We looked at it. We looked at the data and uh, what are the different methods to collect data. In week five, we would look into the specific groundwater hydrology components like porosity, specific yield and specific retention, permeability and hydraulic conductivity. And we also look at the three dimensions of hydraulic conductivity. Then what is a hydraulic head, potentiometric surface, etc. If you remember in the groundwater hydrology class, we looked at a cross section, a groundwater hydrology cross section, and we showed how different wells are connected to each other by a potentiometric surface. So how that is determined, all those things will be taught in this week. So let's move on. The first topic for today would be porosity. So what is porosity? It is the fraction of volume of pore void space in soil. So if you have a soil and uh, you have solid materials in the soil, it is not fully with solid materials. Right? So, for example, you're taking a sample uh, using a cup uh, or a container and uh, if you take it out, uh, if you put soil and take it out or dig and take a soil sample out, it's not fully soil because there is a little bit of space for air and water. And that is initially a void space, which is an empty space. Then as and when water or air occupies it, it becomes filled with fluid. So fraction of the volume of pore to the void space in soil is given as porosity. So theta here, the porosity is given as volume of the voids or the empty spaces by the volume of the total solids, okay, which is the total soil. So you take a container that is the total volume and out of this, how much is the volume of the voids? So types of porosity, as you could see, uh, the first one is a well-sorted sedimentary deposit having high porosity. It's a well-sorted means uh, it is, it is uh, with size. It is of a similar size and a sedimentary deposit, it has round shape, which means it has been transported uh, for a long distance. Good weatherment, okay, so it has been weathered properly and so all the edges are almost uh, are gone so it is all smooth spheres right so that is a well sorted and it is not irregularly arranged it is touching each other which means it is sorted and there is a high porosity because of the size and the assortment you have good spaces here for air or water to occupy then you have a poorly sorted sedimentary deposit having low porosity. So what is a poorly sorted? It's the same thing, okay? same, almost the same uh, solids, but you have these smaller solids, the size is not the same. They are almost similar size, uh, but here you have a mixture of big, small, and very tiny particles. So what happens is the tiny particles can occupy the void space. And that is why the porosity is decreased. So here the porosity is decreased. Okay, then you come to C, well sorted sedimentary deposit consisting of pebbles that are themselves porous. So the whole deposit has a very high porosity. So in this material, you have well sorted, same as well sorted. It is sedimentary, but consisting of pebbles. So a type of rock. 
So sedimentary is the process in which the rock or the material is being deposited. So sediments, okay, that's what sedimentary means. Uh, and but there is a nature of the solid also. So that nature here in C has holes in it. So if you take a sample and you can see uh, within the solid, you can have void space, you can have pore space, but on the sample itself. So here, like here, you don't have space, but here you have folds. Okay. So though, like the sponge I gave an example in the previous class. So here water can go in, air can go in and get stored. This helps in also attracting more water and that is why it has a very high porosity. So along with the spaces, almost similar spaces in between the sediments, but in the sediments also you have space, right? So all this together is being used. Then you have well sorted sedimentary deposit whose porosity has been reduced by the deposition of mineral matter, cementation uh, in the interstices. Okay, so here you do have a similar as A. So here all we're trying to say is from A to D is of same similar sedimentary deposition. So the deposition is the same, which is through water or something it is getting deposited. But how the pore spaces and the void spaces are filled is different. So here you have organic matter uh, or uh, mineral matter, cement, ex cementation, etc. happening within the pores. So it actually drives away the uh, air and water and has very, very less porosity. Okay. So uh, you could see how gradually we are changing in the void space between the solids. E is soluble rock made for us by solution. So this is a typical rock structure in limestone. So if you go to caves and stuff, you see uh, water can cut through rock and then flow. Okay, so that is a soluble rock. Limestone is soluble rock, where water by going, by passing through, it can cut away a path and then go through. So that can be uh, a soluble rock interface. And while it's soluble, please understand that the minerals are also transported. And this is where the salt content comes in. Salt is not in salty as the food, but the properties of the rock. So while it is being dissolved, it is soluble. So it takes the uh, salt from the rock and then goes along. So the porous uh, solution uh, is there, which is the water in the pores and that interacts with the rock, it, it uh, dissolves it and then takes it along. So we have a good flow path. So if you could see it just flows across laterally, etc. Uh, all are connected well. So it is having a high porosity. That is why you see a river underneath a cave. Okay, so that is kind of a groundwater which goes in uh, and comes out cutting down, cutting through the rocks, etc. etc. So it's just uh, dissolving all the rocks. Then you have crystalline rock made porous by fracturing. Okay, so there are some uh, rocks that have fractures in there. And because of the fractures, the water can come in. The two ways. Also, the water goes in and creates a fracture because water expands in the in the cold weather or when the water temperature drops down it expands right if you put a water in a cup and put it in the freezer it expands and uh, the size increases okay so that is where uh, people say do not put a cold drink in the freezer because the bottle will burst uh, so it is um, that same property that water when it goes into the cracks of the rock Let's say it goes in the morning where the temperature is not as cold, but in the night times, the cold temperature can kick in. And in groundwater also, you have temperature changes. Okay, uh, So if, if the water cools down slowly and then it expands, so when it expands, it causes the fractures. And that fractures, again, will lead to more water being stored and movement of water. So now we have seen that how porosity could change uh, within a sediment by the nature of how it's sorted and by the nature of how the particle, the sediment particle is available uh, and also by the process of flowing water. So water can flow through and cut through the rocks and water can go in and cause fracturing. Soils, rocks and sediments and subsurface consist of matrix of solid mineral grains and pore spaces that can be occupied with groundwater. So this is the part where you have uh, inside uh, void spaces and if the void spaces are filled with air, 
uh, slowly water can infiltrate and push the air out. Okay, so uh, that is where you have uh, water being converted into groundwater, so infiltrated and other water. So this is the starting point, as we mentioned in the previous uh, classes also, for fluid flow. Fluid is a mixture of uh, two phases. Uh, through porous media as per Dorsey's law. And in this week, we'll also look at what is Dorsey's law, why is it used uh, effectively. In. So uh, the natural porosity of uh, your uh, soil material or your rock material can be looking like this. You have uh, voids um, where uh, you have uh, air or water or just empty space is called void. Uh, and you have your solids. Uh, in a partially saturated soil, you could have air, part of the void can be filled with air, but most of it water and solids. So I'm just taking a sample, this sample where solids are the same, okay? And this is your void space. In the void space, the partially saturated will have some air and water. Fully saturated soil will have all the pore spaces with water, okay? And then you have a dry soil where air is full. So if you ask me, are there not any water in the solids? Yes, there are. So same here, are there not any uh, air, small, tiny fractions in the solids? Yes, but those are negligible. It's not like it will contribute to, uh, you know, groundwater, this part, or even here, the air is enough to push water out. No, it's a very small part, which as I said earlier, it cannot be taken out. So there are some um, amount of water or air in the soil which can never be taken out. So even by plants, it just remains there because of the property of the soil. So that is why uh, if you want to get accurate estimates, you have to take the sample, crush it, and then put it in an oven overnight or even for a day at 100 degrees. Think about cooking or baking the uh, soil for 100 degrees for at least one day. Uh, so that's how much uh, energy and time you need to spend to drive out the air into vapor. So then only at that point, the soil will give off the air uh, and water. So it is very important to understand that that is the extreme cases and it doesn't contribute to groundwater much. Only these two phases contribute, which is you have a wide space and part of it has air, part of it has water, which is saturated partially. Uh, if it is a fully saturated soil, all the space is with water. Assessing field porosity. How do you determine porosity for every field site? Is it possible uh, to determine at every field? For example, you have a village uh, and uh, uh, 30 to 40 acres uh, that you would uh, need to go and conduct a water resource assessment for which porosity is important to understand groundwater. Is it possible to go to every location and take a sample? No, it is costly and time consuming. Okay. Uh, so, but you know that uh, by the process of understanding the solid material, which is your sands, et cetera, you can back calculate the porosity. It's not an assumption. Someone else has done it for you through a lot of time in the lab and literature based. Uh, so we can use that. So soil geological maps can help. So let's start with understanding the geology of a location. Let's take the village I gave for example, right? 20, 30 acres. Uh, if I know the geology, the first base, the bedrock is the geology, then the soil. So if I know the geological map, I can estimate what type of soil would have been formed because your soil formation is nothing but your geology which has been weathered. So you have the weather, uh, unweathered geology, on top of it you have a soil and this geology maps are available. Same way, based on this, there are soil maps in India. Okay, uh, then using the literature which I'm giving now, you would estimate what is the range of porosity. Okay. Let's have a look. So the fluvial deposits or alluvium, where we saw earlier along the Ganges belt, along the Kaveri, Brahmaputra, Krishna basins, you do have a high porosity, 0 0.05 to 0 0.35. Please look at the range. It could be anywhere from 0 0.05 to 0 0.35. The 0 0.05 is because some of the intermediate voids can have fine, fine sediments that can go in, which we saw earlier in the class, like the last slide. You can have a sediment uh, deposited, but if it is also having a non-well 
sorted sediment. You can have small particles inside. And that happens in the Ganges, et cetera, because it, sedimentation is occurring almost every day. Every day you have sediments flowing, depositing, flowing, depositing. So by that process, what happens is the fine particles can go inside and deposit. Okay. So, uh, and then you have glacial deposits on the Himalayas, which have very, very high uh, porosity because it is big boulders, big rocks, and, and it is pretty well sorted. So it is sorted like this, and inside you have big uh, void space. And then we have sandstone, shale, mudstone, dolomite, etc. So here comes the almost smaller, smaller ones, which are found mostly in your central India, okay? Where you have, for example, fractured 0 0.01 to 0 0.02. The fractured hard rock aquifers we saw last week in class that most of India has uh, hard rock, semi hard rock, uh, unconsolidated aquifers. All these would have a very, very low porosity. Okay, volcanic uh, tuff, basaltic lava, all these. So, uh, most of the rock materials are metamorphic unfractured and fractured, okay? Unfractured means it's not weathered that properly. Uh, fractured means water has gone in and broken. So all those things can happen. So this is pretty common in India. Secondary chalk uh, uh, is, is common. Shales are very common. And then your fluvial uh, deposits, glacial deposits on the Himalayas. So I know now from the geology, I can estimate the porosity. And then if it is a well weathered soil, then you can look at the soil map, okay? So as I said, the geology maps are available. You can go to Geological Survey of India. You can download these maps. And then um, based on this given geology type, you can come back to this slide or the book and then uh, take the values for your thing. But it is a range. So how do you understand where it ranges? It is depending on your field visit. You can take some samples and then see, oh, okay, the porosity is this much. But ballpark you can get. Normally what people do is, if you have two extremes, they take the average or a midpoint in it, okay? So the range is big, but you can take a midpoint. And if you know, as I said, if it is a young fluvial deposit, uh, then you can take a 0 0.05. If it is a well-structured, well-sorted uh, fluvial deposit, you can take 0.35. Okay, so use the previous slide where we looked at the sorting of the rock material, the sediments, and then come back here to see where the range can fit in. Okay, so here is your time uh, on the x-axis um, and mean moisture content of soil on the y-axis. So it is a temporal change in mean moisture content of soil. So your, your soil content is not going to be constant throughout the year, okay? It is because your porosity is constant. So you have a good porosity, okay? But water can go in or go out depending on the use. So if precipitation water can go in, if you pump water can come out or trees, evapotranspiration uh, can actually drive the water out. So soil moisture recharge, let's start with a rainfall season. Okay, so you have your soil moisture recharge. So the soil moisture is filling up. Let's first take a step back and look at the three uh, capacities that in the soil moisture, right? If it is below a particular point, I told earlier, the plant cannot take the water out. It is too hard for the plant to take the water out, it will die. So that is a wilting point. So that is very, very less soil moisture. Then you have field capacity, which is the best condition for the plan to take water because it is uh, well saturated uh, and it is easy for the plant to take. It is not full, full and dripping because it cannot suffocate the roots. So that is field capacity. On top of that is the maximum porosity. So this is the maximum water that can be stored because that is the maximum porosity. In between that, you have the field capacity and then you have wilting point. Field capacity is after the saturated water has come down, after gravity has taken up the water stays in the soil because of the soil's properties. And that is the easiest water for the plant to take out. So what happens is uh, when there is soil recharge from down, the soil gets uh, recharged. So your moisture is coming up. 
it is in the best capacity of the field capacity so the plants can grow well during this part this part of the months uh, and then you have soil moisture above field capacity and groundwater recharge from melting snow cover, cover and spring rains etc uh, this is spring season when uh, you after your monsoon after the winter snow melt uh, is already there it starts to melt okay and then you have a peak uh, summer in this part so what happens is your water comes down from the porous space uh, because plants have already taken it up and your water is being depleted by evaporation so soil moisture depletion as evaporative transpiration increases the plants have taken up and the evaporation has driven the water out so it comes down what happens is it comes down below the field capacity now the plant is suffering it needs water okay you need to irrigate it so soil moisture recharge from heavy summer rain so suddenly you have a small peak small peak because you do have summer rains in summer one odd uh, days you get good rain and so suddenly there's a good peak and then comes back down then you have soil moisture depletion during period of maximum evapotranspiration so this is again uh, another uh, big summer driven uh, event so a big drought or a big uh, hot weather can take more water out and it goes down your wilting point once it hits wilting point you need to give water okay if you do not give water the plant fails so that is what irrigation is okay so here is the peak irrigation time here's your rainfall and snow melt occurs you you're in a happy situation for plant life uh, water management in the village but then when field capacity is there and goes below uh you need to be cautious uh and then some uh, intermittent rainfall can happen uh but then after this summer you have your monsoon so your monsoon picks up september october november okay so soil moisture recharge after killing frost have reduced transpiration so this is a um, example from uh the us but it can be applied to anywhere it's the same thing if you don't have frost you have a rainfall season right so you have a good rainfall then recharge then a good summer which actually drives all the water out and then comes out so this would be your period of irrigation this is what you need to plan if you want to draw, drive crops up okay so if it is a good farmer who says no i am okay only with this crop which is a kharif crop and little bit of subsistence farming like farming for vegetables fruits for the house that is fine you don't have to have good water resources for irrigation but if you're going to put rice and paddy here and then another uh, big uh, hungry crop uh, cotton and other things then you need to actually put in a irrigation structure so move, let's move on to look at the 3d visual uh, a well sorted sand as i said a well sorted means all the small particles are taken away almost similar size you have good water storage very good water storage across the domain you have it and this is your alluvial aquifer ex, uh, experience okay so this example can be taken for those solids uh, soils and rock material which are well sorted and then the fractures in granite which is mostly your uh, hard rock aquifer central india this is your alluvial ganges plain uh, this could be looked at as your uh, central india south india those kind of hard rock aquifers where you have fractures in granite and in the fractures you have water so if you put a pump here you take this water if you take on the sides you don't have water so what is driving it it is the presence of the fractures which is driving it and then you have uh, caverns in limestone so this is the uh, limestone in your mountains uh, or uh, underground where you have a rock that can be dissolved by water so water flows and it can cut and dissect and then go through so uh, these are limestone um, materials uh, and the water can be stored along the cracks and crevices where it uh, flows moving on uh, so uh, focus on vodos and phreatic zone uh, is going to be the important parts in the next more classes uh, because what we have here is we have a focus on vedo zone and phreatic zone okay vedos would be your under saturated uh, um, zone uh, and your uh, phreatic would be your saturated correct so what happens here is you have 
uh, atmospheric water vapor, pre precipitation occurs, land surface, depressions, etc. Infiltration of the water occurs into the Vedu zone, the first zone, which is your unsaturated zone. Then you have your phreatic zone or zone of saturation. So through gravity, water moves down. Part of it goes as base flow, part of it goes as interflow. And at the land surface, you have surface runoff. We've discussed this all well enough in the hydrology class. Okay. So uh, then you have a precipitation and evapotranspiration is the losses uh, from lakes, water bodies, uh, ponds, uh, and then it can also go to seawater. The same thing can happen in seawater. Okay. And this is the magmatic water, the under, under very, very deep conditions, uh, you do have uh, the magma water driven by your lava, etc. Uh, and it can also come to the ocean. So groundwater can exist from here, the Vedo zone until the magmatic water. The Vedo zone is uh, still having less water because it is not fully saturated. And same here, the magmatic water is very, very less in, in volume. Uh, but this is the biggest water resource for groundwater. And here is where you go and see that after some time, it does go to the sea water. So fresh water is pushed into the saline water and also into lakes, uh, ponds and rivers. So groundwater is linked into various components. Uh, if it is an urban city where you have all this land as cement and roads, then water falls and then goes here. So these two parts are not available. Okay. So you can see visually like where the water is starting how it goes into the groundwater and then how it is managed. Please also understand that porosity ranges uh, are different uh, as per different literature. So always use when you want to do a field work and you're trying to get literature for it, use uh, literature which is based out of Indian studies or some Indian studies have used it. So all the books I'm referring to, uh, you would find Indian studies using those literature values. Okay. So well-sorted sand or gravel around 25 to 50%. If you put the percentage, it is that 0.25 to 0.50. Sand and gravel mixed would be 0.2 to 0.35. Glacial till, which is on the Himalayas, et cetera, 0.1 to 0.2. Uh, and then your silt would be 0 0.35, 0 0.5. Uh, and clay would be 0.3 to 0.6%. So uh, all these are taken from very, very old studies. You can see the dates, but again, uh, the porosity doesn't change for a particular rock or material because it is the nature of the rock. Okay, so you don't, there's not much change by new studies. If only if maybe you have a new technology to find uh, better results, it is fine. But again, as I said, it has been crushed, put in the oven, heated, evaporated, so uh, all those values are pretty accurate. So through these lectures, we have seen how uh, groundwater and, uh, enters into the phreatic and uh, your Vedo zone through the porosity. We looked at porosity in detail. Uh, we've defined it and seen how it changes uh, spatially uh, through the layers and also sediments and et cetera. And also we looked at the temporal change in soil moisture. So this soil moisture is very, very important to understand the plant water requirement for agriculture. So all the water which is in the soil can only be going into the groundwater recharge. You cannot have zero soil moisture and groundwater. Okay, maybe deep aquifer, yes, it can come from far away. But in your location, you have to have a good soil moisture to have a good shallow groundwater aquifer. And that is where we would stop. Uh, and go to the next component of the groundwater hydrology in the next class. Thank you.